welcome to Inspiring STEM's podcast program celebrating innovations in scientific publishing and science communications. We are interviewing key opinion leaders and organizations working to advance and quite often to disrupt the status quo. My name is Martin Delahanty and I will be your host. My guest for this episode is Adam Hyde, the founder of the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation, better known as COCO. COCO's motto is, we build, you publish. The organization exists to benefit the publishing community by building modern open source tools that enable the publishing of critical knowledge better, faster, cheaper. A very warm welcome, Adam, to the program. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, second time round. Um, very honored and flattered to be invited again. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I've, I've just, just reflecting on the fact, and it's hard to think, it's almost exactly a year to the week uh, when you were last guest on the on the podcast program, so yeah, time time does move on quickly. Yeah. Um, for those new to the program and maybe unfamiliar with open source co code and its use in in publishing, maybe we could start off by explaining some of the the principles involved. Yeah, well, I mean, open source is a, is a sort of um, uh, a genre of software, I guess you could say, a category. It basically divides into two camps, proprietary and open, or, or proprietary is often referred to as closed, so closed and open. Uh, it is a bit of a spectrum, but um, on each end you have, uh, on the closed end, people develop software and they keep it to themselves, basically. No one else can access it. And this is, you know, the typical kind of um, competitive um market model you know we we have um you're, you're creating scarcity by holding on to the product and then licensing it out to people for use um and then there's um open uh, model and the open model is basically not competing on the scarcity but um believing in abundance and seeing uh, benefits around that and then also trying to generate um, a sustainable model around that so what that means really is um, the, the models differentiate on the licensing level. So closed, it's um, you keep it to yourself and you just give it to people who are paying you for, for the code um, and uh, to make changes. So you become the sort of the only central node potentially. You, you can relicense it or whatever, however you like. But um, with the open model, um, the licensing is very liberal or permissive, are the words often used. That means that um, anybody can use the code, do what they want. They don't even have to talk to you. Um, they can contribute stuff back or not. Uh, they can set themselves up as being experts of this without talking to you if they want to. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you've seen that as a benefit for the world. And there are a lot of benefits. Um, so when it comes to publishing specifically, the reason why open source is, it's called open source, is very um, important is because essentially you have all of these um, closed source softwares that either um, uh, vendors uh, have created, like these big uh, workflow platforms, um, which are all proprietary and closed, right? Um, uh, or publishers, and this happens a lot in publishing, uh, publishers of all sizes have created their own tooling and they don't share uh, you know what they built often because not because they some of them are a bit uh it's an emotional issue as much as a licensing issue some of them are sort of like reticent to let other people compete on technology with technology that they have built um so there's, there's always a bit of funny sort of issues around that <clears throat> but often because it's built into their internal systems they just think oh how are we ever going to share this right mm -hmm. so the, the problems with those two issues are one on the proprietary level um, when you have, especially when you have sole vendors, which is often the case with a lot of the workflow systems and publishing, is that they can they can charge you whatever they want, right? And this becomes very very expensive and has become very expensive within publishing. If you want to get one of the big workflow systems, it's it's crazy expensive, right? So that's one part of the problem. The other one is that they create a bottleneck around extensions to that. So you basically have to get in line and pay a lot of money if you want any changes, right? On the other side, where publishers have sort of developed their own tooling, the problem is is that they've um, invested a lot of um, resources, uh, people and money, into developing what everybody else is developing, right? And so there's all this, in my opinion, wasted effort gone into building like multiple systems that are exactly the same, 
um, you know, over and over and over again across all of these publishers around the world. So it's just costing, it's a needless cost. On uh, Both of these issues just create a needless drain of resources um, on, on publishers. And, and publishers shouldn't have to be burdened by technology like this. You know, the open model, what it presents is an opportunity to reduce those costs to zero if you just take a software and use it, right? You don't have to build it yourself. You don't have to pay for licensing. You may have to pay for hosting, but that's a very small cost. Um, and so, and also, um, you can, another thing that, that Open benefits from is the ability to learn from others. So this model where either a vendor is building the software or publishers are building their own software really creates a problem um, where it's very hard to learn how to build these types of softwares other than by making your own mistakes over, you know, the same mistakes as everyone else is doing because no one's sharing across the boundaries, right? So that's a big problem. Um, so in that instance, um, uh, working collaboratively around open source means that you can learn from each other as well, which is also incredibly important. Uh, collaborative working is, is really, really important in uh, the open source community and that, that's where the real benefits are. And so maybe talk a little bit more about that collaborative working principle. Yeah, okay. So um, the way that open source works within Kotahi, uh, sorry, within Coco, is in, in products that we call our community products, right? So we have some uh, platforms such as Kotahi, which is a um, scholarly publishing platform. We don't call it a journal platform because it actually can do preprint workflows, micro publications, conference proceedings, whatever you want. And then there's Katida, which is a book production workflow. Um, and then there's uh, also a recent one, Coco Docs, which is a, a word processor. So these are our sort of big community platforms. And we bring together organizations around those platforms that have a shared need. Uh, they, they need a solution that these, these platforms occupy. Um, and so we bring them together to work together to uh, help co-design and build the platform. And if we look at, for example, Kotahi, the scholarly publishing platform, that really benefits from this type of collaboration because you're bringing people to the table with disparate experiences and requirements and we're designing with them so that we can meet all of their needs within the one system right and so throughout that through that process they each of those organizations also leverage each other's expertise right Kotahi is really interesting we have publishers but also uh, publishing services vendors involved right and hosting partners as well so each of those can bring a different level of uh, expertise to the table about their specialty. Um, and so, yeah, so we learn from each other and we, you know, we get a kind of a, um, a best of everything kind of approach, right? Um, we really learn from a hard earned world experience. Um, and that, that's very beneficial. And each of those organizations also, they either pay us to develop or extend the platform or they bring developers to the table and then we sit in the middle and we facilitate it all. So yeah, I mean, it um, also means that you end up with a product that has a very broad spectrum of um, workflow uh, possibilities, which is also very beneficial. Yeah. And at a, you know, small, small cost to each of the participating organizations, if, if they pay anything at all. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that, that's hugely attractive. And of course, Coco was founded on open source principles. So maybe you could explain the, uh, how Coco was founded um, and how it's developed today. To date. Well, um, Coco was started with the seed money from the Shuttleworth Foundation. So Mark Shuttleworth is um, a, um, the chap who started Ubuntu, open source operating system. And um, every, uh, every year, um, the Shuttleworth Foundation, which he, he started with his profits um, from various tech enterprises, um, chooses a number of people that they are going to support. Um, so from that, I got a Shuttleworth Foundation Fellowship in 2015, and we used that uh, money to seed the beginning of Coco. Um, so that's that's where it started. Um, and from there, it's sort of grown. We're about 40 people now, um, and we are open source through and through. Uh, we've become very experienced in publishing because we've seen inside, because of this collaborative model, we've seen inside like a vast array of uh, publishing workflows. Um, 
So we've become very experienced in understanding workflow, very experienced in building systems. And um, further we go into this, um, the more open source becomes valuable. So we can really uh, build systems very quickly, very cost effectively. One, one example is just recently, um, <coughs> Lulu came to us, a print on demand um, organization, great organization. And they wanted to build out um, a print on demand workflow. So rather than starting from scratch, we could build it. I think it's going to take us about six months all up, which is extremely fast to build a publishing platform with a relatively small team. So it's fast and cost effectively, cost effective uh, to build out an end to end print on demand workflow that would integrate with the Lulu services. Right. So this means that they can um, make the process of getting books into the system easier for their uh, users. But also because we've built various technologies around uh, automated typesetting that they can actually um, raise the quality of the output rather than people often, you know, trying to DIY approach with InDesign or ex often exporting to PDF from Word, unbelievably. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they can use the, um, the, the automated typesetting systems to, to produce better quality output for publishing in the Lulu systems and targeted to the, you know, the, the Lulu format of content. So, you know, we, could, we can build that really quick because we're experienced, we understand workflow, and we have all this reusable code. So it's, it's really starting to pay off. And um, the, the pro approach to, to working with partners, you mentioned the, the, the range of stakeholders across publishing, not just publishers. Um, how, how have you found, uh, for example, uh, working with publishers versus you're doing a little bit of work for, for digital science as well. You know, uh, have you experienced any differences in terms of like how, they, how they approach and engage with you? Oh, we, we're a kind of like a smorgasbord when it comes to approaches. I mean, we work with people in so many different ways. I mean, digital science, it was basically we supported them uh, in a very friendly way. Um, they wanted to build out um, some experimental workflows for journal systems with um, the sort of customized workflow tools. Um, and uh, we worked with the innovation, um, Simon and Jared uh, department on, on this. And it was actually a really lovely collaboration. Uh, no money passed hands, but we, you know, we just mm. supported them to understand how our tools work so that they could experiment with it themselves. And that was fantastic. Um, and then, you know, we work in a more deeply entwined way with other partners, um, uh, eLife um, particularly, you know, we re really work solidly side by side with eLife. We're having a, a Coco team meeting in New Zealand in the next couple of weeks and uh, Paul Shannon, the, the head of technology at eLife is coming over to spend some time. And, you know, like really also a wonderful collaboration, great partner, uh, we you know, high level of trust and we really understand where each other's coming from. And they are um, uh, put some money into building out of extensions to Kotahi to meet needs for preprint stuff, uh, workflows and also their own um, um, journal workflow. And then, you know, also uh, Amnet Publishing Services, also another great partner. Yeah. Um, and they, they're working on, we're working on several products with them uh, in a shoulder to shoulder way. So, yeah, I mean, like, you know, we, we'll support people that come to the table and just uh, in good faith and they just want to try stuff out and they need to be pointed around the code. That happens a lot. Um, but we also, we get invited to come in and, you know, really... Um, uh, design complete workflows with organizations. You know, HHMI, we built a, um, a question bank workflow, you know, yes. uh, from end to end product and for integration with learning management systems, you know, and that we worked with them and we facilitated co design processes so that we together designed the platform and then um, Coco built it um, for them. So, you know, like either we work on commission or we work for free for people who just want to sort of put their toes in. Whatever. Uh, the only only sort of threshold that we have is basically you have to come to the table in, in good faith. You know, anybody that comes to the table uh, that's not in good faith, we, we just basically tell them we don't want to work with them. Yeah. And I think what what's uh, you know most you know what what's very impressive about Coco is you again your your openness in terms of collaboration. I've uh, you know I've had the, uh, the joy of sitting in a number of sprint meetings where you've got multiple stakeholders commercial non-commercial 
sitting in on just listening on your your sprint developments which i think for many yeah. commercial organizations is still quite uh, unfamiliar because they're more used to developing proprietary systems where everything is you know highly closed and and, and confidential so the openness there is, is is fantastic and also i think what is really impressive is the range of publishing tools that you're working on at one time so uh, mm. you know, you've mentioned katahi um, what, what about other other tools that are you know maybe current that are worth mentioning there's really a lot i mean i think we've been involved in the actual build out you know i mean in this um where we've been involved in a significant way either doing it all of all ourselves or most of it ourselves um in uh, over 15 different products um uh you know which is a, a very you know a very wide spectrum of of use cases you know so I mentioned HHMI um, working with them to build out a really fantastic question bank system, um, which is I think quite different to the approaches other question bank systems um, have taken. And um, you know some of these innovations that we can bring to the table come because we've put time into investing components that can be reused also um, in each of these systems. So we built a fully a full um, web-based word processor called Wax, and that's integrated into the question bank system. The reason why that's interesting is because we can then build uh, question models into the word processor itself, rather than having sort of a more of a traditional form-based sort of question authoring system. You can actually author the questions within the context of other content, and you put multiple questions into one uh, document, for example. So, um, and that's because we've been able to build reusable components. We use that same editor um, or word processor for CocoDocs, which is an open source word processor, which uh, we've recently integrated um, some AI functionality into, into mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Everything we build is reusable, modular, um, and even though it's a hard lift at the beginning, it pays off in the medium to long term. And as we go further, we just become more and more valuable. Um, there's also, yeah, Katita um, building a system for, which is a book production system. We're built, building a system for NCBI for book aggregation. I mean, it's, it's just really a long list of stuff. Possibly one of our most popular products, interestingly, the publishing sector doesn't know that much about, which is PageJS. Yes. We've built an um, automated typesetting engine. Uh, we didn't want to, but there was no open source options for this, and we needed this tool. So we built it as a reusable component, and this gets used everywhere from um, uh, for generating legal documents um, through to it was used in the U.S. elections in um, Wisconsin, I think, for generating mm -hmm. voting ballots mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on a batch process level. You know, just um, I, I don't even know. We think it's probably being used in Salesforce, just from what we can see from the community, but it's just gone mm -hmm. so far and wide. Um, mm -hmm. And it's open source, it's often difficult to track exactly where it goes. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we have a wide array of products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting point in terms of tracking ultimately where the open source code goes, because you, you develop it to a point and then it, you might hand it over to a, say a commercial organization and then they, they continue with, with the iterative development. Yeah. Is, is there any obligation then to, to, to maintain that? link back with you to actually have no. a, a cookie trail back to to the originator yeah. no no i mean we really um believe in the principles of open source right um mm -hmm. we you liberally license something then you let it go into the world and um you know the smart players that use that technology will come back to us because we're the ones that know most about it right so if they want something changed or improved it is much smarter to talk to us than not talk to us. <laughs> um, because if you don't talk to us, you're going to have to learn it all from zero and um, it's going to be a burden. And, th and these, some of these products are very sophisticated. So it's better just to talk to us. Um, but there, there is a, um, a, a, uh, an issue with an open source. They called it the, um, the free rider problem. That's the question, like, you build something, then people go and use it, and it's considered to be ex, uh, exploiting the product. They don't come back to the community and make a contribution. And there's a discussion about whether that matters or not. I firmly believe it doesn't matter whether they give back or not. 
The whole point of open source is to distribute um, the platforms as far as you can. The further you distribute it, you have to think about the return being a percentage. It's not, to, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. If you try and hold it too tightly, you will actually um, uh, stunt the, uh, the ability for the product to proliferate in the world. So you have to really let it go and then just be easy on yourself about it, not worry about it, and then trust in the returns. And that's our approach, and so far it's been working really well. Good. Uh, and Adam, it's going to be really hard not to mention uh, chat GPT, but we have to mention it because you've just uh, engineered a plugin. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. So um, obviously everyone's going crazy about chat GPT, right? And, and it, mm. it holds some obvious benefits for publishing. And so, and there's also, it's not just on pe publishing, but um, AI in general, where it's going at the moment in terms of text processing, you know, you have to see uh, programming as um, text processing as well, right? So there's two levels in which we sort of need to engage in this in this realm. One is on productivity on the side of programming. Um, there's obvious benefits there, and so we're um, getting all of our team um, versed in AI and how it can assist. So AI can check GPT specifically can really help you write boilerplate. Um, code, uh, or mm -hmm. instead of going to Stack Overflow or something to um, look for examples of how to solve a problem in code, you can just actually ask for ex uh, ChatGPT to generate you examples that you can learn from. So there's huge um, productivity gains there, but you have to put the time in. So we're on that path. Um, and then there's also for publishing itself, it's um, AI at large, or the you know the large um, language models. Um, they uh, they offer really a lot um, because you can see it in the way that we integrated in Cocoa Docs is um, in 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 ChatGPT you have what they call a prompt which is just basically it's a little text box where you type in your question you know write a bio about Adam Hyde or something like that right mm -hmm. and then it returns you an, an answer so um, what we've done we've we've taken the word processor and Cocoa Docs. And you can write a text. And you could write that just on the text on the word processor itself. You know, write a bio about Adam Hyde. Highlight it and hit the Chat GPT button, and it will it will replace that question with the with some um, text mm -hmm. that the, mm -hmm. um, that Chat GPT generates. So this is very useful for helping you to get past uh, writer's block and you know generate some stuff that you've written a thousand times and your imagination's failing you. This kind of stuff, right? or explanations, things like this. So this is the start of it, um, but you can see where it can go from here. We're, even at this level, we've done some experiments. So you can, in Cocoa Docs at the moment, you could type a text, highlight it, and then ask track, um, a chat GPT to translate it. We've done experiments from English to Greek, and it works very well. Um, you can also um, ask for um, highlighted text and ask it to correct the spelling and grammar and it will also do this as well. So you can see, you know, just by playing with it, we're starting to see the possibilities where this could uh, hash touch points for, on a very simple level, for publishing. Also, other interesting use cases, um, you know, it, it can do image analysis. So you can ask it on, um, to uh, analyze an image and populate the accessible text for that image, right? Things like this mm -hmm. are very, very useful things. And this is just the, this is just the beginning. So we've built um, the ChatGPT plugin into our um, product Wax, the word processor, that's integrated into Cocoa Docs, so we can use it there. That's the first place that we deployed it. Uh, and if you go to, I think from tomorrow, um, beta.cocoadocs.net, you'll be able to see it there, and you can try it out. Um, and then we're because we've built everything modular, we can now integrate this into... Uh, our book production platform, Katita. We can also um, integrate it into uh, any of the systems that we're building for clients. We haven't talked to them about it yet, but we're, we're going to. Um, and then you can also, um, we can build it into Kotahi as well, the, um, the, the, the scholarly publishing platform, because yes. Wax is integrated there. So, you know, it has, um, has immense potential. The one downfall um, is that ChatGPT, you know, OpenAI started off as a do-goody organization, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it was a not-for-profit, and now somehow they're 
entangled as a, a for-profit uh, and a, you know it's um, it's you now proprietary um, and you know you have to go and pay for the service I mean it's it's hard to run these things right um, mm -hmm. the expensive mm -hmm. enterprises um, but uh, it's really problematic that they are closed so we're starting to look around um, the landscape of open um, um, AI uh, possibilities. There's some for image generation, for example. So, you know, uh, we'll keep pushing in this uh, area, but the utility that the current um, AI uh, products like ChatGPT offers for publishing is really immense. And uh, we have to get across it because it's where everything is going. It's, it's like, um, we don't want to be those people back in the day when the internet came along and said, oh, you know, it, 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 yes. it, it'll never be useful. You know, that's where we are with AI right now. Either you get with it and you really start getting immersed and starting to understand where it's going and how it can benefit um, you, or you're going to get left behind. And that doesn't just apply to us, and this is why we're really getting into it, but it applies mm -hmm. to publishing in general. If you haven't got... Um, AI integrated into your platform, your competitors are going to do better than you. Um, so, you know, that's where we are. Yeah, I mean, it's ex extraordinary. And then ChatGPT is just one of many large language models that are out there. It just happens to have $100 billion yeah. funding from Microsoft to give <laughs> a, a, put a bit of marketing yeah. money into it. So why, why not? But um, yeah, yeah you, you can see the utility of the use and uh, particularly in, in, in publishing, creative writing, uh, marketing yeah. brand associations that, you know, uh, need to create uh, new inventive uh, phrases and, you know, perspectives on the same old. It's, it, it's it's really powerful that that respect I'm, I'm using it for beginning to use it for my work as well um mm -hmm. but so what about other machine learning tools and ai technologies that you see coming to the fore and being integrated into your type of products well i mean just on principle right document analysis is obviously interesting um mm -hmm. so you know like we've this the scholarly publishing industry has spent a lot of money in xml because this is a way that you bring semantics to a document so machines can understand it right mm -hmm. and the big question is you know uh how long is that going to be necessary and there's going to be a sort of a bridging moment right like um uh as we bridge from um you know providing these things as marked up which is very costly very um time consuming process right to convert things to xml Jets, journal article tagging suite specifically, um, you know, it's it's a problem for the industry uh, to create this content, and it also forces workflows into an XML. It has, and I think it's the wrong reasoning, but it's forced workflows into a XML first um, it, mm. um, processes, which I think is also problematic. Um, so the fact that you know content producers can operate uh, on a word processor level. They don't have to understand the underlying semantics they basically for machines they they can work in their human semantic level and then this doesn't not have to go into conversion for a machine to be able to understand it is going to um, mean that we can accelerate um, publishing and that we can um, uh, reduce the cost of publishing as well so i think that is significant i, I would i would say in time we're going to see uh, xml markup become redundant and if your systems are invested in that then you've got costly systems that are unnecessary and going to have to be replaced. Um, that's big. That's really, really that big. big. Um, yeah. So there's, you know, it's just going to hit in so many different ways. Um, and I think at the moment it's on an assist level for content producers mm -hmm. and for developers. Uh, but you can see where it is actually going to make parts of the workflow completely redundant. And c coming back to, to Coco and thinking about the, the, the near future, what, what can we look out for over the next sort of 12 months from Coco? Um, yeah, I mean, like, um, we've been busy in the background working on a lot of products that are sort of coming to maturity. So we've got a lot of products that are mature, but a lot of them that are coming to maturity. And I think you're going to see a lot from Kotahi in the next uh, year. Um, it's really becoming very sophisticated. Um, it's um, now, just of this week, um, a multi-tenanted system, which means that you can have 
one instance can support uh, multiple journals or preprints um, uh, organizations and each of those within the one instance can have its own configurable workflow right so mm -hmm. you know and within that these workflows are very configurable like we can support spectrum from a sort of a typical journal workflow right through to very experimental preprint uh, review workflow right that's already exists so you know this is um this is going to be a real challenge especially when you see um i think what i'm seeing at the moment i went to the stm meeting in frankfurt and you know the big publishers there were sort of saying although it's been a long time coming they've known it's going to come that open access is more or less winning right and they conflate open access with the web i think i think they see this as um, scientific communications um, finally coming to the web and when it comes to that um, what i understand from publishers I've, I've had this conversation a number of times is that the big workflow platforms are not really geared for open access and so they're looking for open access native systems, basically web native systems. And if you ask me, there's only one out there, <laughs> and that's Kotahi. You know, yeah. it's got all the modern stuff already built in there. It's got uh, real-time collaboration, um, chat, uh, video conferencing, you know, uh, uh, drag and drop configuration. You know, it's, it's all within Kotahi. And, um, I'm not really seeing that anywhere else. Um, and also production, web-based production tools, everything. So I, and I, I, think, I think there's gonna be um, um, a dawn for Kotahi when we get people suddenly realizing, um, well, nothing sudden, but people are gonna realize over the next year mm -hmm. just how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, we're, you know, we're not alone in this. We're not, um, we're, we're not really very good at marketing. We're good at building. But um, that's why we partner with people like Amnet who can take it out into the market and eLife and, and promote the products. Um, so, yeah, Kotahi is a big one. Also, the work that we're doing with Katita um, for book production is really moving things forward. It's, um, it has a real utility in the use case for print and demand, and we're working with Lulu to build that workflow out. Mm -hmm. And we're, what we've done there is um, very interesting. And... Lulu are very enlightened. They they headed up or they were started by Bob Young, who started Red Hat, um, which is a big open source organization, one of the first to, to be able to find a business model for open source. And um, and so they are commissioning us to build this workflow, which will be open source. So they don't care if other print on demand um, um, organizations use it themselves. And so that's going to be very interesting as well. Um, yeah. So. On top of that, we're going to keep pushing into the AI stuff um, and, um, you know, just continually improving the automation for typesetting. Uh, that's, we can now produce jacks out of Kotahi to push button um, without, with, by providing tools that you don't need to understand XML in order to be able to use. Um, mm. You know, so there's just, there's, yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of maturity of the products. You'll see some client products um, starting to see some daylight, uh, like the Question Bank um, uh, platform, which is very interesting. Um, and I, I imagine from these things, we'll see the, um, the, the number of collaborators coming to Coco to continue to, to grow and possibly uh, accelerate, I hope to accelerate over the next uh, year or so. Yeah. So how, how best can potential partners approach Coco? Yeah, well, we're still, you know, very informal in many ways. Um, you know, we, we're tightening up on the on our um, on our business processes, definitely. Like, you know, um, uh, but on the on the human to human interface, <laughs> we like to keep it good good faith and easy going. And so, um, the best way is you just email me directly. You know, I, um, if you email Adam at Coco Foundation. That's my direct email address. And um, I'll read every email that comes in and respond and we can get a conversation going and see if there's um, interesting synergies. Fantastic. So I'll make sure to include links in the, the podcast to you. to you directly and to Coco and I'll uh, link out to uh, some of the products and services that we mentioned, some of the partners as well, so that we've got a, a sort of a, a information base against this, this podcast. Um, Perfect. Adam, thank you so much for your, for your time. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to 
uh, our next meeting, but uh, also looking very forward, forward to the, uh, the products coming out. All very exciting now, as you say, you've, you've, you've been working on these, many of these for a long period of time, and they've all come to fruition almost you know, around the same time, so exciting times. I wish you uh, the best of luck. Uh, thank you again for your time, Adam, and we'll, we'll speak again soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again.